Hi guys, um, welcome to my talk about the practical approach in exploit development for embedded devices. So um, while I prepared this talk, I realized the topic is so huge. So today we will not focus on the, on the exploit development process by itself, because I think it's well documented over the internet. Um, today we will focus more on the step right before, on getting the testing environment, on setting everything uh, up to start your exploit development experience. So we will talk about emulation, but give me a second, give me a few slides, and then you will see what I mean. I'm a penetration tester at Siemens in Munich. A while ago, I've written a book, Hacking with Metasploit, and during the last few years, I've developed a bunch of uh, exploit modules, a bunch of auxiliary modules for the Metasploit framework. Most of them are focused on the embedded device area. So today, you won't hear anything special, anything new, anything super exciting. Probably everything that I will show you is documented somewhere in the internet. But that's the problem. To start in this area, you have to read through a huge amount of blog posts uh, in different qualities. And in the beginning, you probably waste a huge amount of time. So um, today we don't talk about a special rocket science. We talk about the practical approach so this approach I've used multiple times um, to develop different uh, exploits. And so probably you can also use it, but um, take a look, be careful, because we don't talk about the theoretical approach, which is nice, shiny and clean. Uh, probably in our uh, process, it's getting quite dirty, but we are result oriented and our result is a working exploit. The exploit must work on the final, on the, on the real device. So if it's not working, then we have to go a uh, step back a little bit and analyze it, why it's not working. But this is our goal. So um, in the first slide, I have to mention emulation. So what is this emulation thing at all? So Wikipedia <laughs> has a quite nice definition for us. In, emulation, uh, in computing, an emulator is hardware or software that enables one computer system, which is called the host. The host is more or less our, our system that we are using for our analysis tasks. Uh, for example, our Kali Linux. And this system should behave like another computer system, the guest. Uh, the guest is more or less our embedded device or the operating system of our embedded device. And an emulator typically enables the host system to run software designed for the guest system. So, in, in short words, that means that uh, we have an embedded device, we have the operating system of the embedded device, and we would analyze some, some part of this. And we try to run this part on our host system, on our system that we're performing our analysis within the emulator um, to have direct access to everything. Why should we do that? Um, if you're starting digging a little bit into embedded device exploitation, um, then you're running into multiple problems. Uh, one of the first problems you're running into is how do I get my, my binaries, my files, my tools to the device? So probably you have shell access, or probably there's a wget on the device, then you're fine, you can just download, uh, um, upload it to the device. Probably you have uh, hardware access via UART uh, uh, and you can use it or there's uh, uh, some the, the problems in the update mechanism. So you can create a new firmware image, or patch it with your binaries and upload it to the device. But probably you can't do anything of this. So in emulation, you have the control of the file system. And so you can just, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, you can just copy and paste it to the file system and you're ready to go. We'll see it a little bit later. Um, another interesting aspect for emulation is, are the debugging capabilities. Um, if you're trying to debug an embedded device, you have different possibilities. Uh, you can use JTAG, you can upload a GDB server stop. In an emulator like QEMO, you have a directly built-in um, um, GDB server stop. So you can just switch it on, uh, connect with your debugger and you're ready to go. Um, then you're co in control of the resources. You can uh, configure how much CPU power, how much uh, memory, power, um, uh, memory space your device has. And finally, I think for me, the most important aspect for emulation is 
that I can analyze a device, that I can write exploits without having the device. I can do it in the train, I can do it at home, I can do it wherever I want without need the box in front of me. So our emulator of choice is QEMO. QEMO stands for Quick Emulator. It was created in 2003 by Fabrice. <laughs> And it supports a huge amount of different architectures. For example, it supports x86, it supports uh, MIPS, Spark, ARM, PowerPC, and uh, uh, you, you typically will find different architectures in such embedded devices. So as, <coughs> as, ma as more uh, architectures are supported by an emulator, uh, the more flexible you can, can work with it. Um, then we don't ride a dead horse with QEMO. Because QEMO is heavily developed uh, uh, since 2003, and also there are different other projects based on QEMO. Uh, some examples are Unicorn, which is a CPU emulator. Then there we have uh, Sibyl. Sibyl is more or less a, 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 a brute forcing tool, a brute forcing uh, tool for for um, um, discovering function, the functionality of functions. For example, if you're dealing with a big uh, binary which is stripped down, you don't have function names, uh, Sibyl is probably able to discover at least some basic functions like a steer copy. And then we have uh, the, the avatar framework, which is a huge framework for embedded device emulation. So um, to start with QEMO, um, feel free to just install the packages of a distribution or install it from source, it's not that hard. And then think about what we wanted to do with this new and shiny emulator. So don't think uh, um, of the emulation in a way that, yeah, now we can emulate our embedded device, we can work with it like, on the, like the real device, and we can break it like the real device. Now, um, keep it simple. Keep it as simple as possible, because otherwise it bites you. So. Um, if, you, if you're dealing with emulation, if you want to analyze some part of the embedded device, then try to emulate this part and nothing else. Try just to focus on this part. Keep it as simple as possible, otherwise you're wasting, you will waste so much time. So to, to do this, to do this quite effectively, we have different approaches, different possibilities to do it. So the first one I've mentioned before is the CPU emulation, which is done by Unicorn or Sybil. Um, QEMO by itself, by itself uh, will help you with the user mode emulation. I typically use the user mode emulation to get um, uh, a first smell, a first taste of the binary. Is it possible to emulate it by, at all? Or, or how, how, how feasible is it? Um, how is the binary working in a user mode emulator? But it's typically just for a first trial. Um, if you're digging a little bit deeper in emulation, then you're typically dealing with system mode emulation. System <coughs> mode emulation means that you're booting up a, a whole operating system within your system that you're using for, the, for your analysis. So if you are having your Kali Linux, then you're starting your, your emulator. Within the emulator, you're booting up another operating system. Typically, this operating system matches the architecture of of um, the embedded device. <coughs> so um, there we have different approaches. We can use a completely third party operating system, uh, which is, uh, 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 has nothing to do with the, with the em embedded device that we are analyzing, expect the architecture. Then we can um, um, boot up the file system of the embedded device with a, with a different kernel. So as long as we don't do anything kernel related, we are probably good to go. And another prop possibility, to, possibility that we have is um, if we're dealing with some kernel related stuff. Um, so for example, if your embedded device has some kernel modules shipped with and you wanted to analyze these kernel modules more dynamically, then you can try to build your own kernel that fulfills the needs of the kernel modules and it fulfills also the needs of your QAMO of your emulator, so, boot, so, boot, so you, you're then able to boot up your new kernel uh, that is able to hopefully load the original kernel modules. And finally, I've mentioned before, the full system emulation, uh, which also includes unknown peripherals, 
uh, which is done by the avatar framework. But this is a completely different story. Today, we will primarily focus on a short shot we have on user mode emulation. We'll take a little bit the longer shot on the system mode emulation with a third party operating system and the system mode emulation uh, with the original file system from the embedded device. Um, to start with your user mode emulation, you probably, um, the easiest way is just to, to use some embedded device, some, some file system update file from a vendor. You can go to the footnotes, there's an advisory uh, from, from a vulnerability in D-Link DIR645 DIR device. Uh, take, go to the website, download the, the firmware from the vendor and extract it with Binwalk. Binwalk is a firmware extraction framework by Greg Hefner. And um, for, for such simple firmwares, it's doing a really, really good job. So then you need a, a statically compiled user mode QMO. Um, you can install it via your package management system on Debian. I know the statically compiled user mode QMO uh, binaries are available or you compile <laughs> it by yourself and copy it to, your, to, your, to the folder where the firmware is extracted to. Change to the firmware, uh, to, the, to the folder, um, and then start it via change root. Start your um, statically compiled emulator, and in this case, just for a first test, um, start a bin ls command or something else, which is in this case a, a, a simple link to, to BusyBox. To analyze now such a binary a little bit more in detail, you can, for example, use the included str uh, um, um, tracing command. So with the S trace switch, you are now able to, to trace the syscalls of this binary. It's quite fine to check it out if it's missing something, some files, some directories, uh, or something else that is typically created during a boot up process or on, on some, from some other binary or something else. So for a first analysis, it's quite fine. And then you can also directly start the debugging stop. Uh, you can start a, a GDB server and then with the, with the minus G switch, and then you're able to connect to this GDP server via uh, GDP client or via uh, either pro, for example. Um, this, in, in this case, I uh, emulate um, a CGI. It's uh, the authentication CGI of the DR645, which has a buffer overflow in it. And the CGIs um, um, need the, the, the parameters by environment variables. And so you're able to use the capital E letter as an option within QEMO and pass this, this options um, um, to the authentication CGI <coughs> um, um, binary. So um, with this method, you're quite fine and you're now able to de develop a full-blown memory corruption exploit within user mode emulation. But as soon as you're trying to, to run this exploit on, on the real hardware, you're running into troubles. Because um, in, in such embedded device exploitation, for example, for MIPS or ARM architectures, you're typically using an exploitation technique which is called return-oriented programming. Um, and you need stable library addresses. For example, if you're using uh, ROP, gadgets, ROP gadgets from a microlibc, which is in, in this case, the, uh, in, uh, in this exploit, uh, I've done it that way, then in emulation, uh, the microlibc is loaded on a 408 address. But if you're dealing with the real hardware, you can see that it's uh, on a completely other address. So you, now you're able to develop a full-blown exploit, but this exploit won't run on the real hardware. So for developing the exploit on the real hardware or for, for, for modifying your exploit to work on the real hardware, you probably need access to the hardware to take a look at the load addresses of the libraries and fix it up. Or you can uh, use system mode emulation. And now I will give you a short introduction into the system mode emulation thing um, in the easiest way. So we are booting up a third party operating system, um, which is uh, uh, completely pre-installed and use this third party operating system to install, uh, to, to, to develop our exploits. Mm. So as before, uh, we're dealing with real world scenarios, real world vulnerabilities. <coughs> so a while ago, 
Uh, Realtek has shipped a software development kit with uh, vulnerabilities to different of the uh, vendors, to different partners, and they have just used it as it was, and they got a, a nice and shiny command injection vulnerability in their European PSOAP interface. Um, it was in the in the area where can configure port forwarding via UPnP, and there is a variable, the new internal client, uh, which is uh, your, your internal IP address, and within this variable you were able to inject uh, arbitrary commands. As typical for such devices, everything runs as root, so you don't need any privilege escalation process for it, or you are directly root, or you have direct root access. So, our goal is to verify this vulnerability, to uh, write something like a proof of concept, to write the full-blown exploit, everything in emulation without owning the device. So now let's start and download the firmware, one of the vulnerable firmwares, uh, for example, from the link in the footnote. Uh, extract the firmware again with binwalk and um, Next step is to, 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 anal to do a first quick analysis to find out which architecture this embedded device is use, using. So for example, use a file command. Um, you can also use readelf or you can use uh, binwalk. Um, with this um, knowledge, you are now able to go to the Debian website, download the QEMO <coughs> Debian images and uh, let it run within QEMO. So, before install QEMO from the packages or from source code, and then you're able to boot it up, log in, and you have a, a full-blown MIPS uh, Debian system uh, running on your, or for example, on your x86 architecture on your Kali Linux or something else. Um, a quite useful step is uh, set up bridging between your emulated device and your host device, because it simplifies your life. Uh, you can just as, uh, uh, copy something via or, or SCP, or um, if, the, um, if the service you're analyzing is opening some ports, you can directly access, this, access it via the network. So it will help you. Um, now we are on the, on the Debian system. Uh, you can see it on the command prompt. It's a Debian MIPS, uh, because the firmware is MIPS architecture, big Indian. And um, now, you don't need any emulator anymore because you are already in the right architecture. So you, you're now able to just run the binaries from the original embedded device on our um, emulated Debian environment. Um, uh, the problem now is that we don't have our tools anymore like before. On user mode emulation, we were able to use just the S-trace switch to do a little bit tracing of the binary. Now we have to compile it by ourselves or get it from somewhere, um, which means we need a statically compiled S trace. The easiest way is just to install your um, um, GCC, for example, on your Debian MIPS system and compile it over there. Or you are also able to um, um, take some, some cross compilation tool chain. Um, you can build it by yourself with, with build root, for example, and then compile S trace. Uh, uh, compile S trace, GDP server, and uh, uh, Netcat. I think these are the, the three most most used binaries in in a, in a basic analysis way. Um, so now um, now we are able to try it out. Uh, first try with Mini IGT, which is our UPnP server. Um, it complains, okay, there's something with the WAN type. Uh, uh, probably it needs some some options with it in an unconfigured state. So after digging a little bit deeper in the firmware and via Google, found out, okay, with these options, it's quite happy. So uh, this is our, our network interface. This is just some dummy IP address, and then it's fine. Mini IGT is fine and uh, 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 tries to start up a little bit more. Uh, the next error that it was running into is uh, we don't have a configuration file because probably it's stored somewhere, uh, or it's stored not in the, not in the firmware upgrade. It's stored somewhere, somewhere in the flash. <clears throat> and so we have to create some configuration file. I don't know how it looks like, so. Uh, but probably I don't care about it because uh, in the first step, just create the file. Don't create any content. Keep it as simple as possible. And as we have created the file, Mini HD was quite happy with that and it proceeded. And the next problem that it 
run or was running into is that it tries to find something in the directory Linux IGT, some files over there. And after a short check, the Linux IGT directory wasn't there. So probably, oh, so um, um, step a little bit back and think about our environment. We have a, 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 our Linux system that boots up our Debian Linux system within the emulator and within our own directory, we have our embedded device. This embedded device is in an unbooted state. So that means that everything that is done typically during the boot up process, we have to do it manually. So check out uh, the whole um, 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 initialization scripts. In this case, it's in init.d folder, the RCS file. And if you are looking for Linux IGD, we can see that the directory is created during the boot up process and it copies something from a temporal directory to the Linux IGD directory. So now we know, okay, where everything happens, what happens, and now let's do it manually. And finally, the next problem. Uh, it has some troubles with the temp directory. Yeah, the temp directory was a simple link to another directory <laughs> that wasn't there. So um, create it or just remove the simple link and create a new temp directory. And then we are ready to go. Uh, Mini IGD doesn't die anymore. It starts up quite fine and it creates a port and is listening on it. Finally, we are now able to connect to this port via a typical web browser and we can see the description of the SOAP interface. Um, with this description, we are now able to build our, our SOAP request, our proof of concept. All of this is running in emulation. So now uh, use just uh, a simple interception proxy with a repeater or something else like burp and you're able to create your UPnP request for the port forwarding and in the new internal client com um, um, in the new internal client option you can see just the first proof of concept I inject my, my shell command with backticks so that if there is a uh, uh, if the, the, the device creates a bigger command with with the new internal client IP included so it, it executes my command first and uses the, the, the value that is the output of my command for the bigger command. So my command is executed, the other command I don't care anymore. And we can see on the, on the uh, left side that the file is created and so our proof concept succeeded. So now it's time to create the full blown exploit. I have done that for you and just, just a quick, quick step about the configuration. We have a MIPS big Endian device, so uh, uh, choose the right target, the right payload. And the interesting stuff is the exploitation process by itself. It looks a little bit weird. Um, that's because I've used the CMD stager technique, which means um, we don't use any, any download uh, or, the, or upload mechanism from the device. Uh, we don't need any wget or any other stuff. We only need one echo command. And we can use this echo command to, to write or our payload via the command injection vulnerability to the embedded device. So um, um, we have a few lines of output. That's because our, our um, 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 space of the command injection is quite limited with around 40 to 50 character space. So we need to do it again and again and again and again and again until the whole payload is transferred to the target device and then it gets executed. And you can see we are now um, we have now uh, pwned ourselves, <coughs> our embedded device, in emulation, so you can see the, the whole file system over there. And um, we have exploited, we have, oh, we have we verified the vulnerability, um, exploited it and written a full-blown exploit without having the device. But yeah, probably I'm correct, probably not, so don't trust me. Um, the guy that has originally discovered the vulnerability has seen the exploit, has verified it, and it totally, totally does work on the real device. So now we were able to exploit or to write a full-blown exploit without having the device. So let's go on to the next step. The emulation of the whole operating system. Oh no. We don't emulate the whole operating system because, as I mentioned before, keep it simple, as simple as possible. So uh, get rid of the kernel stuff because we don't need it. 
Um, now, um, oh, so, sorry. Um, um, get rid of the kernel stuff. So now we just um, um, use the extracted directory structure from the original file system. We create a new file system and boot this new file system uh, 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 up. Um, with, a, with another kernel. For example, we can use the, the same Aurel kernel that was used for the Debian system, also for this uh, or new file system, or you can build your own. So, as before, we talk about real world vulnerabilities, this time in, in an NCC binary, NCC service of uh, different D-Link and TrendNet devices. The NCC service is quite a huge binary blob. Uh, which does everything on the device. Um, it, starts, it does the configuration stuff, it um, loads kernel modules, it starts up a web server with the management interface, and um, it also, also includes a diagnostics area. And this diagnostics area um, is available unauthenticated, and you can ping other systems. Um, but you can do much more, as you can see over there, in the ping IPv6 address, um, you can inject your own commands, once again, arbitrary commands, and they are getting executed uh, with full root access on the device. Our goal is the same as before, uh, uh, set it up in emulation, verify the proof of concept, write the full-blown exploit, which works on the real device. So this time, um, you can use uh, 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 some, some other firmware, uh, that is vulnerable for your, for your testing. Um, extract it once again with Binwalk, the firmware extraction framework, and now create a new virtual hard disk. Uh, you can do it with QAMO image create. Uh, typically, it, it is enough between 10 and uh, 20 max. I've used 100 max because uh, I've played a little bit with the kernel modules. And then create a file system on your new hard disk. Um, typically, I use X2 because it simplifies your life. Uh, our, the Aurel kernel supports X2 and it's also quite easy to, to compile a kernel with X2 support. Uh, mount this new hard disk, copy your extracted file system, the whole directory structure to your, to your uh, mounted, mounted hard drive. Um, then uh, think about your kernel stuff because um, you probably need some kernel modules for your for your network interface or for other hardware areas. So uh, if you're using the Aurel kernel, um, copy the kernel modules from a booted Aurel image, uh, uh, copy it down and copy it up to this uh, uh, um, to this file system, and then you're ready to go. Or compile your own kernel, like in this case, uh, there's a two. 6.36 kernel running um, and you can, com can compile it in a way that you are able to, to load the original kernel modules from the firmware and um, you can also use your own kernel modules. Now you have a, a directory structure on your hard drive and then unmount it and oh do, do a quick check. Um, I had multiple times the problem that the, uh, that the uh, device directory wasn't filled up so do a quick check uh, if there are the, the basic devices like the null device, uh, urandom and console. And then you're probably able to boot it up and you're ready to run. So this time we have a MIPS little endian device. Um, so use the QEMO system MIPSL and give it uh, your, your, your newly uh, created um, um, hard drive. And in this case, the Aurel kernel, boot it up, the system boots up mounts the root file system, for sure it's X2, but it gives no root shell. And this is because uh, the device has no TTY0 configured, so in this case you can see it's quite easily, uh, it's quite easy to reconfigure our emulated environment, because just uh, mount um, your, your, hard, your virtual hard drive, uh, change the, the, the needed settings, and then unmount it and boot it up again in emulation. And then uh, on the next try, it tries to start the NCC binary. That's fine because it's the main binary, um, but it fails quite hard because it hangs around in a loop and it tries to load a configuration file. Oh, I love configuration files. So um, this time it doesn't help to just create the configuration file as an empty file. 
Um, it hangs around because it cannot read this because there's no configuration in it. Um, so there are different possibilities now. You can probably go to the real device. Oh, we have no real device. That's not that good. Um, so we can we have to find another way. We can reverse it now a little bit more, or we can just remove it. And in this slide you can see. Oh, the NCC binary is a really nice binary because um, it's not stripped down. It has all of the function names in it. So after uh, ju just uh, looking a little bit in it, you can find a function that is called load CFG. And in this case, you can see a typical MIPS uh, function call. The load CFG address from the function is loaded into the T9 uh, register, which is a quite nice indicator that they're using GCC as a compiler. And then um, the load CFG function is called via jump and link register. And the interesting thing in MIPS is that the knob uh, uh, instruction is quite important over there because MIPS is using pipelining and this is called a branch delay slot, which means that uh, as the jump and link register, the, the, the more or less the call of the, of the load CFG function is executed, then the next instruction is already in the cache. That means before the first instruction of the load CFG function is executed, the next instruction, in our case, the knob is executed. So that's quite interesting as soon as there's something else in the next instruction as a knob. So always uh, uh, take a look over there because it can bite you quite hard. So our, our quick and ugly fix again, uh, as I mentioned before, it gets dirty, so just knob it out. We don't need any configuration. And the next thing that you're running into on the next, next boot up process that it ne uh, needs access to the, to the flash device, to the MTD device, and we don't have it. So uh, we just give it an empty text file. And again, it is quite happy with that. So now let's go on. It tries to configure a device without its configuration file. Probably that's not the best idea for the device. Mm. But we have a lot of debug messages and we can use these debug messages again to uh, find the right area in the NCC binary. For example, there's something, you can see it over there, uh, something with bridging, it tries to set up the bridging and you can see in the strings output that there's some bridge control command. And with this uh, little hint, you're getting, getting quite fast to a function that is called layer 2 or pfunc. Uh, this function is called multiple times during the whole binary. So our first approach from just patching the, the call uh, it would be a little bit of work here. So it's probably a little bit easier. So just um, say, okay, uh, doesn't matter from where you are, I will go back to you. So our function uh, is not that big anymore. It's just one instruction and it goes back to the, to the place where it was called from. And now we are able to run this NCC binary without any, any, any critical errors anymore. You can see it over there. There is a port 80, port 443, probably the web server. And we can now try the proof of concept. So just use the original proof of concept, the curl command. You can see it on the, on the bottom that in, in our emulated environment, it tries to execute the ping 6 command. And now we are ready to tell it into this device. Uh, or into this emulated environment of our, our device. So again, we can write the Metasploit module. <clears throat> this time I've chosen another, another technique. I've chosen the technique to download and execute the payload. So this time we're using wget. Uh, we set up a web server with the payload and we in, initiate the wget command via the command injection vulnerability. So via wget, we take the payload, download it, or make it executable, or give it executable rights and execute it. And finally, um, the command shell gets opened and we can see it over there. Uh, the ping six command is executed uh, uh, again. In this case, multiple times, you don't see it over there. So, um, emulation is quite a fine thing, but uh, you have multiple limitations in, in your emulated environment. So um, in emulation, everything needs a little bit longer. If it fails or it works, you take more time for failing or for working. 
Um, if you're not able to extract the firmware, uh, you have troubles because this, the shown techniques won't work. Um, if you are dealing with kernel stuff, it's quite messy, but it can work in different situations. Um, and it gets really painful as soon as the device is doing a, a lot of hardware interaction. So then you probably have to build your, or have to reverse the hardware, or you have to patch much more areas from the, from the binaries. Uh, you are probably directly in kernel area. Um, it's getting really painful. And um, the approaches that you have seen are primarily targeting Linux-based operating systems. If you're talking or if you're trying to analyze real-time operating systems, then it's a completely different story. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you for interest. Um, my name is Michael Messner. Uh, feel free to contact me and enjoy the B-sides. And if you have questions, I try to answer it. Yeah, yeah. Um, typically, um, it's purely reversing. Um, so you have to, to analyze the, the, the decryption algorithm, um, where it gets the keys from. Is it encrypted? <coughs> Is it obfuscated? So um, it's, it's getting, getting uh, uh, real hard and uh, real, you need a, a huge amount of time for it. Um, and if the, the key material is stored quite secure, then you're, you're uh, as, an, as a pen tester in, in troubles. Um, <coughs> you can see it much more on very important devices, yes. Um, yeah, it's pure, pure reverse engineering to pure anal analysis. And you typically need the hardware for it because somewhere in the hardware typically is the key material stored. Hmm? So you're doing side channel attacks too? Um, I have done it, now, <coughs> but I have colleagues that are doing such stuff. Hmm? Just yeah. From your experience, do you see um, always more signed firmware than, than in the past, or is it not something that? that um, it depends on which uh, which focus we are talking about on on such a home home router stuff uh, or IoT stuff in this area. Um, I don't see so much uh, signed stuff. Um, the firmware is, is quite quite uh, uh, simple. Uh, it's uh, um, um, you typically you're able to modify it for, for and update it also. Um, in an in a more professional area, you see see more more signed firmware. Yeah. I had an actual question. So. As we just saw uh, when I asked at the very beginning, who here is hardware, who here is software, there weren't many people who raised their hand for hardware. Yeah. But hardware is becoming more and more important because it's controlling the world. Um, what sort of attackers do you expect who are actually doing this kind of attack? Is it typical kitty hackers? Is it nation state? Is it somewhere in the middle? What kind of attackers do you see um, doing this type? I, feel, I think um, one of the biggest problems for our typical kitty hackers is that you you, you, you need a box. As soon as you're talking of, about hardware hacking, you need the box, and uh, the boxes are quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, most, of the, most of these kitty hackers are probably trying to start with, with, the, with the software side, with the, with the firmware. And if you're talking about um, 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 encrypted firmwares with key material in the box, then oh, the kitty has also no, no chance. Um, so I think that the bar is, 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 is getting higher and higher as more as we are, we are having a professional hardware. Because, because it's just expensive for, for usual hackers, but it's no, no reason for, for a state uh, uh, to buy these boxes. So in this case, uh, 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 they, they will have the money for it. And then if you wanted, if there was somebody, sorry, um, if there were a software person who wanted to migrate into the hardware world and wanted to try something out with 
Kuyemu. Mm -hmm. um, what firmware would you recommend that they the practice firmware's, with? The firmware is from Footnotes. Okay. You can, um, I hope I have uh, 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 not forget any step, but usually you should be able to, to do it by your own uh, with downloading the firmware from the Footnotes and uh, 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 reprocessing all of the stuff. And then you should be able to, to get the same results. Okay. Are there any other questions? So thank you, Mike. Thank you very much.